houses. Nobody has that right. Every crack pusher can expect to get cracked when I become president. Jackson's appearance impressed those on stage with him, too. It's like you're standing there and you're looking and you see him on TV every day and you see him, you know, just to see him in person is like, you know, it just totally just bugs your mind out. You know, he's shaking his hand and everything. I'm probably going to go home and just pass out or something like that. Besides the political speeches, there was some hardcore rapping courtesy of Eric B. and Rakim and the multi-platinum LL Cool J, who turned on his hometown crowd in support of his candidate of choice. It's a strong record, a record for the strong, for those who appreciate real rap songs. I wanted to do this thing for Jesse Jackson, support him, show him my support, did a few songs, and enjoy myself, you know what I mean? It was cool, it was a good workout. As for the rest of the presidential campaign, we thought it would be a good time to hit the streets to find out what issues are on the minds of young America. I think they need to take a big stand on drugs and uh, the homeless and what's going on in this country. And I would specifically say drugs in, the, in this country, especially in the cities, the inner cities. We can't let people starve and uh, that we can't blame them if they are starving. I believe that drugs is a very vital issue and um, should be dealt with by all the um, presidential representatives. Well, I'd say uh, drugs, uh, education itself. And I think generally just the attitude towards young people. I mean, treating them like people and not like stupid things. ZZ Top ended a long layback on Thursday when they popped up in Clarksdale, Mississippi to pay tribute to one of their idols, the late, great Muddy Waters. ZZ guitarist Billy Gibbons brought along a guitar he'd had custom crafted from a piece of wood taken from the house in which Waters was born. Gibbons donated the guitar to Clarksdale's Delta Blues Museum, a fledgling project for which ZZ Top is attempting to raise $1 million in expansion funds. This is a symbol to uh, continually recognize the blues as an American art form. The instrument itself uh, features a, a squiggle of the Mississippi River to symbolize the, the power that's embodied here in, in what we speak of as the blues, uh, ending right here at the end of the instrument in the Mississippi Delta. Thank you. And with the kickoff of Van Halen's huge Monsters of Rock tour a little more than a month away, Eddie Van Halen has just left the hospital. After recently returning from a wedding anniversary trip to the South Pacific island of Fiji, Eddie came down with a mild case of dang fever, a little-known tropical virus. He responded quickly to treatment, though, and this weekend he and the rest of Van Halen are in rehearsal for the Monsters of Rock show, which hits the road May 27th in Alpine Valley, Wisconsin. This week, more dates were added for the Headbangers' Dream Tour, including dates in Detroit, Houston, and Kansas City. Van Halen, Scorpions, Dokken, Metallica, and Kingdom Come will wind up their U.S. trek at the end of July. For the past 20 years, Neil Young has been one of the most eclectic and unpredictable artists in rock. Always changing with the times, if not with the trends, Young is a complete musical chameleon. In his latest incarnation, he's coming on as a blues man, playing small clubs around the country with his 10-piece band, The Blue Notes. It's just music and it's some blue notes. For 20 years now, Neil Young has gone his own way as an artist, oblivious to all pop fashions and transient musical trends. He became a rock star with Buffalo Springfield in 1967 and a superstar two years later with Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young. On his own, he's recorded songs in every style from folk rock to synth rock and through it all, he's steadfastly rejected every label tossed his way. Sometimes one type of music is a better vehicle than another type of music to get this, uh, to get this out. So. That's why I keep changing. And other times, what I'm thinking inside, I don't necessarily want to have right out there in front. His last tour, he played straight ahead rock and roll with Crazy Horse. But Young's latest artistic incarnation is as a sort of a hippies bluesman, Neil Young and the Blue Notes. He's recorded a new album with them, This Notes for You, and he's on tour playing all new songs, tapping into his love for the music of such bluesmen as Bobby Blue Bland and Jimmy Reed. They're all there because, uh, because I listened to them. When I was in high school, uh, Jimmy Reed was m one of my favorites. I had more Jimmy Reed albums than anybody else when I was going to school. So I loved the, uh, that kind of music. And uh, <clears throat> I wrote a lot of songs in that vein back then. I got a in this crazy world. Whatever one may make of his music this time out, it's at least brought Young back to the concert stage. He's playing small clubs because he says that's the Blue Note way, and once again he's rocking as only Neil Young can. If you're going to go out on the road, you have to be ready to 
give everything you have, and you have to make sure you really got a lot to give. All by Dang. Dang. <laughs> we will have a look at Madonna's new look when we come back. Plus a chat with Demi Moore, star of The Seventh Sign. People have asked me, you know, has marriage changed your life? And being married hasn't changed my life as much as just my whole relationship. What could possibly be hotter than a ticket to Bruce Springsteen's Tunnel of Love tour? A ticket into the Tunnel of Love itself. Win MTV's Take a Ticket to the Tunnel contest, and you will actually hit the stage with Bruce Springsteen and the E Street Band and take a ticket to kick off the Tunnel of Love show. That's right, you on stage with Bruce and the band. You'll help Bruce start the show, then watch the whole concert from a VIP seat in the front row. Fly you and a friend to Bruce's show, put you up, and hand you $2,000 cash. The band worked for years to get that ticket. All you need is a postcard. Write your name, address, age, and phone number on it, and mail it to MTV's Take a Ticket to the Tunnel Contest. Post Office Box 1211, Radio City Station, New York, New York, 10101. You, Bruce Springsteen and the E Street Band on stage in front of thousands of screaming fans. Enter now so you can take your MTV ticket to the Tunnel of Love. Another day begins. Good morning, class. Doing Kenny. Will you tip You're late. There's a lot to be learned. Hi. Failing my class. No grades, no football. Milky Way. I'll try. Helping you through your day. Trickle, trickle, the drip drop. Doing the seven up raindrop bop. Splash, splash. Don't stop the seven up raindrop bop. Cause it feels so good. Coming down, 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 down on the top. Take a splash, splash, we like this. About to tap and do the raindrop bop. Seven up rain so good. The raindrop bop, drop your bum now. Gone so far into the future, the time has started all over again. I wonder if they know any other words. I bet they understand this. I love your dress. Well, thank you. You must tell me who does your hair. Wilma, you did it. No big thing, Fred. I just use the universal language. Welcome back to the week in rock. The universal language. Mm -hmm. hmm. As popular as Madonna's music's been for the past four years, her look has inspired just as much attention. With Madonna now sporting yet another new image, we went back to see just how many changes she's gone through. Madonna. Pop star, movie star, model, dancer, and now Broadway actress. Which one is she really? What do you think? The truth is, she's been a mall. But as she changes from one role to another, one thing stays the same. Madonna is one of the most photographed women in the world. And every little change she makes in her looks makes headlines. She's been a blonde and a brunette, been sleazy and been glamorous. But each and every time, the look has been all hers. Do you think someone else could come up with this? <laughs> the woman who inspired a generation of wannabes has unveiled a new high fashion look in the latest issue of Harper's Bazaar. And that sent us to the streets of New York to ask people the burning question, which Madonna do you like best? Thoughts of presidential politics went out the window as John Q. Public wrestled with the issue. <laughs> I like that look. Yeah, that's, that's, that's it. That's the, that's the look right there. Oh, that's pretty cool. That's the look. Uh, the live to tell look, definitely. I thought the dark actually looked better. Like a virgin. This is literally hot, you know. <laughs> Body like that. And what's the verdict on Madonna's new look? This look is nice, but it's not her. It's just too, too normal. Any look that she comes up with, they'll probably accept and copy, and you'll find so many lookalikes, it'll be incredible. She should give up modeling if that's what she wants to be. And I think she needs to keep coming up with new looks, you know? I think definitely they'll accept it and they'll love it. 
And throughout the 80s, little wavelets of British pinup pop stars have been washing up on American shores. Rick Astley, Swing Out Sister, Curiosity Killed the Cat, and now Bross. They're the latest big British thing. They sell almost as many posters as they do records in their native England. And here, perhaps, is why. When will I, will I be famous? It's a question on just about everybody's mind, but only one group had enough nerve to actually sing it on a record. 19-year-old twins Matt and Luke Goss and their school friend Craig Logan waited five years for their chance at 15 minutes or more of fame. And now Bross have taken the UK by storm with good looks, a slick pop funk sound, and vocals that sound more than a little like Michael Jackson. If we let that right in the studio, he's done a vocal take. If we let him run wild, he'd uh, he'd have like you hear to see like a Jackson or Stevie impression, like Stevie like mainly. So uh, we got to can't. We, we have to calm down. We have to straight out. Say, come on, that. You know, no one's with there. And then Craig's got. You know, me and Craig are very similar because we you know we like used to jam together all the time. You know, like, and so you know, a combination put together, it gets brush sound. Oh, bros is usual. Bros, yeah, bros. However you want to say their name, this group has scored a number two album and two number two singles in Britain. Fame can be fleeting though, and Bross is wary of being here today, gone tomorrow. We prepared ourselves because that already was from Britain four tracks for the next album, and the first album only came out today. For their next move, the band hopes Bross Mania takes hold here like it has in England. But they've got a long way to go, a fact some of their fans back home have yet to realize. True, and this girl handed me, handed me a Michael Jackson book and said to me, can you get me his autograph? Can you right? get there? So it's like they obviously <laughs> think that if you're famous in England, you're famous all around the world, which is, I wish it was the case. When will I, will I be famous? The 60s would have been a lot less psychedelic without the poster art of Peter Max. But Max the artist dropped out of sight in the 70s, and he's only recently resurfaced with a new painting style. Uh, what motivates me to paint is the will to paint, as I have this tremendous wish to paint all the time. And I get up in the morning and I, I think about painting or drawing or creating something, you know, that at the end of the day I'll be able to look around and see what I created. Fame came to Peter Max in the 60s, when his first poster sold 4 million copies in nine months. His surrealistic paintings placed a visual stamp on the entire period. But it wasn't just pop art, there was a strong message behind his canvases. You know, I was very much involved in the cosmic consciousness, the developing of, uh, of a one planet and one people, which really came out of the 60s, and I was very much into that. He also got into merchandising, something that made him a lot of money, but brought him a lot of grief. I found myself in a five-story building with about 55 people, and a billion dollars of product hit the uh, marketplace in 1970. And what was happening is I wasn't painting anymore, or hardly. So Max dropped out for 16 years and just painted. He decided to come back on the White House lawn of all places where he painted the Statue of Liberty. Today with his canvases selling for up to $250,000, Max is working in a new style. This is the style I'm working in right now. The colors are very, very strong. The juxtaposition of colors are powerful. You know, the face can be purple, the hair can be pink, the clouds could be orange, the sea could be uh, black, white, or pink, but not blue. Although his paintings are costly, he hasn't abandoned the pop art that first made him famous. He's just completed a tour poster for the Grateful Dead Spring Tour, designed a station ID for MTV, and he's back making products again, like affordable clothing and watches. The fact that fans and people are requesting things and can't pay for the large paintings, it's, uh, it's something I'm doing for them, you know, and I'm also enjoying it. Max's paintings burst with color, but they don't show any conflict or violence. Instead, the images reflect the person who paints them. I think the most important thing in life is to be peaceful and to be calm and to be happy. And then everything else comes from that. If one isn't happy and one isn't peaceful, then all our mo mo motivation during the day is based on the wrong things.
In the world of books, the biggest headlines this week belong to Michael Jackson, who finally released his long-awaited autobiography, Moonwalk. Among the omissions in the 300-page book, Jackson says he's had two nose jobs and one chin job. He says he used to steal his mother's jewelry to give it to his favorite teachers. And although his first ever date was with Tatum O'Neill, Michael says his first real love was Diana Ross, whom he describes as a mother, lover, and sister all in one. Elsewhere, a controversial book on John Lennon due out this fall from author Albert Goldman has started a nasty rumor about Yoko Ono. Goldman reportedly claims that within a few months of Lennon's death, Yoko secretly married her business partner, Sam Habitoy. Habitoy vehemently denies the claim, and he told MTV News that if it is part of Goldman's book, quote, it sounds more like a book of fiction than a biography. Finally, one piece of fiction that's definitely getting a lot of attention is The Mysteries of Pittsburgh from 24-year-old rookie writer Michael Chabon. It's a coming-of-age story about a young gangster's son, but the title of the book has other meanings as well. There are a lot of features of the, of the Pittsburgh landscape, just the way the city looks, the way it's built out of hills and rivers and stuff, that, that produce a lot of mysterious places, mystery spots.